welcome to Pittsburgh. All right, guys, we're going to have a little, it's going to be a little different this morning. We're not going to have a, for those of you that think it's too loud, the drums are too loud, the drums are loud, this is your morning. No drums. So we turned everything else up. No. <laughs> Just kidding. So just sing along like we got a drummer. You know the songs. Help us out. Ready? Here we go. One, two. With the shades of his glory, wakes us with mercy and love, Jesus does. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children. church my don't you all look rested yeah all of you but me I uh, my clock said 4 a.m. this morning my body said it was five because it's been five for months and uh, you know it'll take a day or two but I'll uh, 
I'll get that other hour back, but it'll take me three days to catch up on all this sleep. But that's all right. That's okay. We have a promise today, church. You know what it is? That if two or three will just come together in his name, he'll be here. He'll be here. And we've well got that many. So just I hope you are expecting great things because God has great things in store. This is the first Sunday service of November. Let's just set the standard for the entire month. Amen. We're glad everyone is here this morning. We're especially glad to have Greg Watson with us. Greg and Tracy are able to be here. Amen. Amen. Glad to have them here. Want you to uh, continue to remember Kim Miller. She had some surgery yesterday. Continue to lift her and her family up in prayer. Pray for those people in this service. Pray for these people on the stage. Uh, pray for the people at home joining us. Pray that we get us out of the way and let God do what only God can do. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here. We are so excited about just coming and worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Father, we want to lift up your name this morning. We want to glorify your name, and we want you to be all that we think about, all that we concentrate and focus on this morning. We ask that you would bless these people on this stage, that you would anoint them, and the message and the music would be clear, it would be plain, and it would be heard with our ears but felt with our heart. Lord, we pray for those joining us online. We pray for those that are sick today, those who need a touch from you, no matter where they're at, no matter what's going on. You have the ability and you are able to touch them, and that's what we're asking for, that's what we're praying for, and that's what we're seeking through today's service. Lead us and guide us, Father. Help us to glorify your name in all we say and in all we do. Amen. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I'll raise a hallelujah. I've watched the darkness flee. I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon. Is a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me.
I know who I am Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the start Now I am chosen Free and forgiven I have a future and it's worth the living cause I wasn't made to be tending a grave I was called by name born and raised back to life again I was made So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours, and I was made for more. I know who I am.
a time or two there were bridges crossed and burned but through all the wreckage I have learned there's one thing that I can never lose if I got Jesus I've got all that I could ever need so take If I got Jesus, there's a hope that's living deep inside, and a joy that I could never hide, and a safe place to fall. If I got Jesus, I've got it all. I've seen weakness turn to strength. I've seen failures made with grace. And it's not from what I've done. It's Christ in me. A miracle I can't explain. Oh, he's given me his name. I'm the richest man. If I got Jesus, 
You've heard a better message in the last three songs than I can ever preach. Now you have. Were you listening? Did you hear them? This last song, you know, most of the time, these things are just a nuisance. But last night, they were a blessing. My granddaughter sent me a song. Now, I'd have been thrilled if she was just singing the alphabet and sent it to me. Or the phone book. I don't care. You know, whatever she does, I'm going to like. Amen. But you know what she was singing? It wasn't a country song. It wasn't a pop song. It was the last song they sang. The goodness of God. That's what she chose to send me. And you know how on the end, when Angie was belting it out, old granddaughter was belting it out. I'm telling you, it was going. It was there. And I've heard that song for years. But I've never heard it as sincere as that one last night. At that age, they're not all caught up in all the junk we are. It's just plain, and it's honest, and it's what she wanted to sing. Wouldn't it be good if we could get halfway there as adults? Wouldn't it be good if we could see beyond all the stuff and just let God be God? They've told you in the song, you're made for more. They've told you if you got Jesus, you got it all. And they told you in the last song that you need to know how good God is because God is good. You just need to know that. It's not something you can be told about. It's something you've got to know. Because I've been telling people about it for 40 years, and they all don't know it yet. But those that know it, know it. And if you don't know it, if you just think it today, you need to know it before you leave this building. You will wonder, why did you wait so long to not just know about God, but to know him. All right? We're going we're gonna to sing one more song. And I, and I don't know if I'm going to preach or not, but we'll just wait and see. Okay? But either way, we want to do what God wants done. Is that what you want to?
You're my refuge in the storm. I just get the high points this morning, but I really, really need you to hear what I want to share with you this morning. Uh, and it's got less to do with me and more to do with the Lord than anything I can come up with, okay? I'm not really preaching because I want to preach. I'm, feeling, I'm preaching because I feel like I need to preach. I need to, 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 to share this with you. Uh, First Peter. The fifth chapter, verses 8 and 9, where I'm, most of the scripture I give you, if I give it all to you, most of it's coming from the, from the New Living Translation this morning. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It's familiar scripture, you know it from the King James. But it says, to stay alert, watch out for your enemy, the devil. He prowls a li around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him. And be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering. She just sang that song, You're Not Alone. But the whole goal of your enemy is to make you feel like you are. To make you feel like you're the only one. That everybody else has got it together except you. You know? We all look like we got it together, but half of us can't even find it, let alone try to get it together, you know? You have an enemy, and you need to understand who and what that enemy is. Now, we are living in times right now, right now, where we are constantly being distracted by the things of the world and encouraged to compromise your basic Christian values, your basic Christian beliefs, your basic Christian ideals, it, it, it's out there everywhere. Now, what I just read to you describes your enemy as a roaring lion. And that's what you keep looking for to come at you. But that's not how he comes at you. You know how he comes to your house? As a lost baby kitten just calm and peaceful and quiet just needing a little saucer of milk to make him okay you know and and you know nobody hates kittens a lot of people don't like cats but nobody hates kittens you know they're just so so little and tiny, and they come in, and you know, and 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 you know, you as parents have all told your kids, "We're not getting a cat." But what about a kitten, mommy? You know, that's how your enemy comes, and you let him in the house because he's just a little kitten. He's just a saucer. Man. It's not going to hurt. A little bit don't matter. Do you realize? that every kitten grows into a cat? 
They do. Every one of them grows into a cat. And I, if you're a cat lover, I apologize. But cats are the most independent creatures God ever made. They are. They have a mind of their own. I had a cat one time. He didn't live in my house. I lived in his. And that's kind of how he looked at it. It's the same thing your enemy does. He comes in and just kind of takes over and makes what's yours his and takes everything away from you. Church, I'm going to give you three things real quick that you have to do. We have to learn that the enemy's real desire, according to our scripture reading, is to devour you, to take everything you have, to rob you of everything God has given you, and to just, just want to throw in the towel and give up. I'm going to give you three things this morning. The first thing you've got to do is you've got to stay alert. That's what our scripture reading says. First word, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. Stay alert. Now, I don't know if you're a football fan, and I'm kind of a football fan, and my wife likes the Chicago Bears. I don't know why, but she does. Now, a couple of weeks ago, the Bears played the Washington Commanders, all right? And it's the end of the game. The literal last play of the game. Bears have got this thing wrapped up. Bears fans are just, whoo, ecstatic. And one player, last play of the game, He's down by the end zone, and the play's back over here, and he's this way. And he's taunting the fans, the Washington Commander fans. And he's going on and messing with them and has no idea they've hiked the ball. He's just going on, you know, and waving and all, because he knows they've won the game. It's over, man. We've won. The Bears fans are yelling at him, hey, hey. And the Washington Commanders, they're behind, last play of the game, and they do something called a Hail Mary. Y'all know what that is if you don't ask somebody, because I don't have time to explain it, but it is a play of desperation. All it is, okay? And this guy runs around and up to give his teammates time to get down in the end zone and the bears are down there and they're still yelling at this clown over here because he's still going on you know he's oblivious to what's happening round about him and this guy throws that ball well this guy they finally get his attention he says oh no I, I, I'm supposed to be over there, and I'm over here. And he runs as hard as he can over here, you know. Now, every Hail Mary, you got places you're supposed to be. Some guys are supposed to be in front. Some guys are supposed to be behind. He was the behind guy, but you know where he went? To the front. And they passed that ball, and if you've never seen it, 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 it looks like, you know, feeding time with the alligators. They're all together, and they're all looking up like that, and the football's coming down, and instead of trying to catch the thing, which is the proper thing, my guy, way over here, runs all the way across. Instead of getting in the back, he tips it. Just spots it up in the air. Woo, done good. And it went over their head, and there's a guy from the Washington Commanders just standing back there. Falls right in. The, the, the announcer said, easiest Hail Mary catch in the course of football. He's, he's all by himself. Boom. They lost their game. It was over, but they thought it was not over. Why did I tell you all that story? Because he didn't stay alert. He got distracted way over here because he thought it was all good. He apologized to the, you know, I thought it was real funny. When you read the article, it says he talked to no reporters after the game. <laughs> well, duh, you know, when you mess up that bad, you don't want to talk to anybody. He put in an apology the next day, and he said, I learned it ain't over till there's all zeros on the clock. We have to stay alert, church. 
We get distracted. This is a true story. Crystal and I are talking. We went camping last week, and Crystal and I are talking in the camper. And I've been watching this squirrel for two days. Run across the road and gather nuts and run back, you know, and run across. and I've been watching him for two days, and, man, he was working like a dog. And Crystal's sitting here talking to me, and the window's behind her, and we're carrying on a conversation, and all of a sudden she sees my head go like this. She said, squirrel, right? <laughs> yeah. It was. Literally. Literally. It was. How easily are we distracted? How easily do we get our focus off of God and onto the things in the world? How easily does that happen? And it's because we are not staying alert. Our scripture reading said, stay alert and watch out for the enemy because he wants to devour you. We have to stay alert. King James Version says, be sober, be vigilant. What that translates out from the Greek to mean that to be aware. To be aware. The enemy will make you think that white is black and black is white and that gray is okay. Okay, all right? It's not. Black is black and white is white and and, and gray just ain't nothing, all right? We have to learn to, to be able to tell the difference. The enemy is a deceiver and he will make everything look different. I talked a week ago at, at, at the devotional here at Quarterly about this thing called AI. I don't know anything about it. I don't necessarily like it, but with AI, you can put a cat's head on a dog and they'll convince you it's a new breed of animal. I, I don't understand all they can do, but I know it ain't good. You've got to be able to know what is and is not real. And the only way you can know that is by staying alert, by seeing what's going on. All right? Ephesians 6 and 11 tells us that we need to put on all of God's armor so we'll be able to stand against the strategies of the devil. We need that. And the, the, the armor of God is not set up so you can just go to the closet and say, well, I'm going to wear the breastplate today, but I don't want the helmet to mess up my hair, you know. Or, or I don't want my feet shot with righteousness because i got my new shoes on, you know, and it just don't go with my outfit. If you got to put it all on or none of it on, you don't get to pick and choose. Put on the whole armor of God, all right? And you know what the armor of God consists of? A few things. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of power, faith, salvation, and the word of God. When you learn those things and you know what they are, you'll understand them. You need to understand and you need to be aware that everything you see is not as it appears. You can learn to be able to see the difference and know the difference. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, church. Our battle is not with one another. We battle ungodly spiritual forces, and we've got to see them for what they are. Matthew 26 and 41 tells us that the spirit is willing, but that the flesh is weak. Our spirit wants to do that, but, but our, our, our flesh won't let us, let us try. Our flesh is what the enemy appeals to to lead us astray. We must stay alert and to learn to recognize what's happening when it happens. All right, you've got to stay alert. Next one is you've got to stand firm. That's what our scripture reading said. Stand firm against him. Stand firm against him. Now, first church I pastored, we used to sing a song. It's about a tree planted by the water. And, and, and it says, I shall not be moved. You know, I'm not going to sing it, but some of you old saints of God, you know that song. Some of you young saints of God may have heard that song. But man, that chorus says, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Though all hell assail me, I shall not be moved. It's scripture, folks. Jeremiah 17, 8 and 9, it says, For, for he shall be as a tree planted by the water that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The, the, NI, the NLT says it like this, that last line, their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit fruit 
They never stop producing fruit, church. We have to learn to stand still. Do you know the difference between being active and being passive? Active is doing something. Passive is, well, I'm just going to wait and see. All right? Active is doing something. Passive is not. We need to understand that when it says to stand firm, the Greek translation for that phrase means a sense of active resistance. When you are standing firm, you're not just standing there doing nothing. You've got your eyes focused. You're alert, and you're standing firm on what you know, on what you believe, and what you know to be true, and what you know to be so. Church, we've got to stand firm. How do we do that? James 4 and 7 out of the NLT says, Humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James is tying the fact that humility is important if you're going to stand before your enemy. You have to humble yourself before God. You have to acknowledge the fact that on your own you can't do this. But with his help, you can make it. Part of my problem, part of a lot of people's problem, is we don't even call God till we've tried it on our own and made a train wreck mess of it. And then we say, Lord, I, I, I need you. And he'll come and he'll bail us out, and everything's good. And the very next time, I try to fix it again myself. Yeah. Why do we do that? You can't stand against the enemy by yourself. That's, that's the next point I'm going to make here in a minute. You've got to have God's help, number one. You've got to have each other's help, number two. We must learn to stand. We must learn to be counted as part of the redeemed. We must learn to, to, to know that being strong in our faith, in our belief in God, is required if we're going to stand. There's that old country song that says, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Well, if you're going to stand for something, stand for God. Stand for the faith and the beliefs and the values of Almighty God, not somebody's opinion, not what, what Facebook or the news or anything else says, but what thus saith the word of Almighty God, because it has been tried, it has been tested, it has been tried to be disproven. One of the greatest atheists in the world set out to disprove the word of God, and as he got to studying, he became a child of God, he became a Christian because of that Bible, not by anybody's teaching, not by anybody's preaching, but by what the words in this book. Everything you need can be found in this book. Folks, you have to learn to stand on it. And last but not least, stand together. That's what a scripture reading said. Remember that your family of believers all over the world, we've got to stand together. Remember your family of believers you they had no idea what I was preaching I had no idea what they were singing but they have sang this message that last song and you said you are not alone I cannot repeat that phrase enough I cannot pound that into your spirit enough because that is the number one thing your enemy tries to convince you of that th that you're all by yourself that this is all you you are not alone. You have a family of believers. You have people who are praying for you and will pray for you. But preacher, they don't know me. The thing about this church, they don't need to know you. All they care about, if you have a need, they'll pray for you. Well, they don't know what my need is, but they're talking to the one that does. And he's the only one that really needs to know, to be quite honest with you. I don't need to know. I, I would like to have your name, but if I don't, I can say, God, you know, they sit kind of on this side toward the back or that side toward the middle, and God will know exactly who I'm talking about. He is that good. It's all it takes. But you need to understand you're not by yourself. You are not alone in this. God didn't design you to be alone in this. 1 Corinthians 12 and 26, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. You are not designed to be alone. You know, I told you that Chris and I were camping this past week, and it doesn't matter if it's 25 degrees or 95 degrees. When you camp, you've got to have a fire. 
I don't know. I didn't make the rules. I'm just trying to abide by them. But if you're going to camp, you've got to have a fire. Some people are more in it than I am. They have a fire 24 hours a day. I don't know how they stoke that thing at night. don't know why they stoke that thing at night. But I don't care what time I get up. I can see smoke rolling down somebody's campground. You've got to have a fire. You all seen a campfire? We ain't never going to get done if you don't. You all seen a campfire? Yes. All right. Y'all, you know the thing about a campfire for a guy? Campfire got to be poked. Got to be prodded. Got to be stirred around. It's what we do. There's a madness to our method. Or maybe a method to it. No, I had it right the first time. But you know what I have found? A fire burns better when it's all together. I can roll one chunk of wood off of it that was burning good. You know what it does? It quits burning. It just sits there and smokes. Take that same piece of wood and put it back with the fire. It reignites and it burns again. Some of y'all, it's going to get dark early tonight. So you try this. You see if I'm not right. All right? You want to know my point? You come in this building, and you think I can do this all by myself. You know what this building's for? To reignite the fire. That you come together with other just chunks of wood, because we're all just basically big old chunks of wood, and we come together, and we make a fire. And the fire burns hot and the fire burns bright. Is fire important to God? Well, let me tell you. Yes, it is. When the temple of God was nothing but a tent and a tabernacle, there was one group of people that their whole job, their whole mission in life was to keep the fire burning inside the temple of Almighty God. And they did it 24 hours a day, seven days a week to keep the fire burning so that no matter what time anybody got up in the night, they could look toward the temple of God and see that the fire is still burning. Church, the biggest question in, the, in today's church is, is it still burning? You know how you get a fire to burn? You put wood on it. You know what you are? Your wall just chunks of wood. And when we come together, we can have a fire. And we can burn hot, and we can burn bright, or we can just sit there and smolder. It's separate. It's up to us. That's our choice. Well, preacher, I don't know that. I've built a lot of fires. I never introduced my wood to each other. Never. I just lump it all together. I don't care if it's oak or maple or hickory or what. It all goes in the same pile. All burns. All burns. So maybe you don't know this side, don't know this side. This side, that's that side. That side, that's this side. Now you're all friends. You people in the middle, you're closing if you can reach across the aisle. We're not alone in this. We have to learn to stand together because your enemy is going to separate you and try to destroy you if you allow him to. Galatians 6 and 2 tells us we are to bear one another's burdens. James 4 and 6, 5 and 16 says we are to pray one for another. Hebrews 10 and 25 says we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you need to see the day approaching. Do you know what it is to exhort somebody? Exhorting somebody is not saying, hey, how you doing? That's not exhorting somebody. Exhorting somebody is when your grandkid is, I don't care what they're playing. Your grandbaby Best kid out there. I don't care if he can't walk and chew gum at the same time. He's my grandchild. He's the best one out there. And no matter how good they're, when they run by, go, baby. Come on, go. Am I lying? No. You grandmas, you know what I'm talking about. And heaven forbid one of them other kids bump your grandbaby. Woo! 
I have seen some hot grandmas. I mean mad hot. <laughs> Got to clarify that one, did I? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's the only thing any of y'all going to remember in this whole message, and I've worked myself to death on this message. Mad! Pray for me, Kenny. Mm -mm. My point is, if I can remember, my point is we need to encourage one another. We need to exhort one another. This place, that's what it's for. This is a place of encouragement, not discouragement. This is a place where we need to lift people up instead of dragging them down. This is a place where there should be no judgment whatsoever. Leave it outside or leave it in your car, but do not bring it in here. We need to be the people who are encouraging, who are uplifting, who are igniting one another's fires, that, that, that we can be the people that are going to stand up together and defeat our common enemy. Our enemy is not each other. We have one common enemy, and he's out to devour us. And if we don't stand against him, he will do it. Now, I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I'm telling you, somebody here needs to hear this. Maybe it's just me. And if it's just me, that's well and good. But I'm telling you, we've got to be alert. And we've got to stand firm. And we've got to stand together. And when we stand together and you proclaim the name of Jesus and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, your enemy will turn tail and run because he cannot cross the bloodline and he cannot stand to hear you talk about it. Oh, he gets better all the time. Greg? Why do we got to be together? Leviticus 26 and 8 says, Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall before you. You've got to understand, we are better together than we are apart. We are better together than we are apart. And when we come together, I want you all to socialize. I want you to visit with one another. But man, when that first song starts, I want you to shut the world out. And let's just have church. Let's bind that common enemy. I had a church member call me. Remember, it's been a few weeks ago now where, we, where the Lord just showed up and we made a circle all the way around this church. You, you all did. I didn't. Keith and I didn't have a thing to do with it. You all did. Had a fella call me a day or two later. He said, you know what stood out to me about that, about that whole circle? This fella, he's not been here a long time. He's been here long enough to know he likes it, but he's not been here all that long. He said, you know what stood out to me? That circle. We had every door blocked. Enemy couldn't get in. Every door blocked. Enemy couldn't get in. Church, God will raise up that hedge round about you if you'll just let him. We're so busy cutting the fence and, cut and putting down hedges. Let God raise it up. We have to stand together. Stand with me. Seems like all I could see was a struggle. Haunted by a ghost that lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my failures Wondering how long is this going to last
When you look at this prisoner, say to me, son, stop fighting a fight. It's already been won. I am redeemed. You set me free. Shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain. Cause I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. Don, you go ahead and come up here. I, I got to tell you one more thing. The Lord just showed me back there when he was singing about staying alert. You cannot stay alert with your head down. Get your head up, church. Get your head up. Get your head up. You are part of the redeemed if you know Jesus. You are a child of Almighty God. Get your head up. Devil will keep you looking down, and you miss everything in this life that's happening. You miss everything that's going on. Get your head up. Bad things happen in life. Get your head up. Difficult times come. Get your head up. Stuff you don't want. I know. Get your head up. Let the doctor say, do you really realize what's going on? And you say, yes, I do, and my God does too. Amen. That's what it's about, church. That's what it's about. Now, we're going to anoint Don this morning. Don's got some health issues going on, and he's trying to get in to see a specialist. So we're going to take him to the specialist before he gets to see the specialist. All right? Deacons, if you'll join me up here. Anyone else who wants to pray, we welcome you. If you want to be anointed, you come right up here and get in the front with them, and we will do that also.
I say this every time I do this. This is obedience is all this is. This is doing exactly what the word of God says. Is any sick among you, let him call upon the elders of the church and let them pray for them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. There's nothing magical about this. There's nothing, there's nothing special about this oil. This is some of my favorite oil. It came all the way from Israel. I hope it lasts for till I go back. Don, we're going to anoint you right now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And we're going to pray that prayer of faith. Because the Bible says it's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. Saves the sick. So let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we call upon you, we're so grateful that you've given us the right words. You've given us the things to do. You've told us how to get the entire attention of heaven by following in obedience to your word of God. And, Lord, we've done that this morning. Don has, we have. So, Lord, we pray this morning, God, that you would touch his body, that you would touch what's going on within him. That, Father, when he goes to the specialist, the specialist says, well, what are you doing here? I don't see anything. Amen. That whatever was there will be gone, and whatever's trying to get there won't be able to make it in. Father, we lift him up to you, and we ask this in the name of Jesus, knowing that that's where the power lies, that that's where the faith and confidence is, that there's in that name, the name that's above every name, there is strength, and there is power, and there is encouragement. And, Father, we can have all of those things if we just trust you and, and, and rely upon you. Lord, we put faith in doctors and we put faith in hospitals, but help us to put more faith in you than anything else. Help us to pray for those doctors and pray for those hospitals, that they do things above and beyond what they ever thought they could do. And Lord, however you choose to do this, this I know in my heart and in my soul, you will get the glory. You will get the glory. So Father, we commit this need to you. We pray for Don, we pray for Sharon, and we as a church family want them to know they're not alone. They are not alone in this. And everybody else that's part of this church family, you are not alone in your health battles. You are not alone in where the devil drags you down to. You are not alone in anything. We are here to pray for you, to help you, to do what we can, to reignite the fire. Every church service is about reigniting and rekindling that fire. And we will do it till the Lord comes back. For, Father, we thank you. We know that you are the God that's able. And we believe in what we're asking. And we ask this thing in the name of Jesus. And all said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Sir Van Wynn. Yes, sir, brother. Bless you, Don. Love you. Love you. God bless you all. Prayer meeting at 5, church at 6 tonight. Have a great day.